Welcome to Live Label Free, the podcast where we talk about all things eating disorder recovery, autism, entrepreneurship, and so much more. I'm your host, Livia Sarah, and my mission is to inspire individuals from across the globe to live a life in which they feel fulfilled and free from limiting labels. I am so excited to have you here and cannot wait to dive into the episode. Hello again, my friend. Last week, I announced that I wanted to dive deep into more extreme hunger content, which many of you seem to be very grateful for, because I know it can be so incredibly scary to experience what almost seems like mental or physical torture when you've gotten so used to ignoring your hunger or distracting yourself from thoughts about food But as I explained in my last episode, extreme hunger is simply our body's way of getting us out of energy deficit as quickly and efficiently as possible. Now, recording that episode was definitely a labor of love, but the result is your quick and dirty extreme hunger 101 that is just jam-packed with value. So if you have not yet listened, I highly recommend you press pause on this episode right now and go listen to that one first and meet me back when you're ready. Speaking of jam-packed with value and labors of love, I do want to remind you that you can still get on the wait list for my soon-to-launch Extreme Hunger course. Just head over to my website, livelabelfree.com, and navigate to the Extreme Hunger course page, which you can access via the link livelabelfree.com slash extreme dash hunger dash course. I am so excited to announce that all of the content for the course is finally finished. Sorry, I I don't know where that came from, (laughs) but I am planning on launching it very soon and even with a twist because as I was thinking about all the launching logistics the other day and everything I have to do leading up to the launch, I thought about how I could make this course even better and even more special for the people that commit to it as soon as it launches and don't wait because I think the sooner you commit to something the sooner you commit to full recovery and honoring your extreme hunger that just increased the chances of you reaching full recovery faster so I'm not giving anything away yet with regards to what that exclusive deal is going to be but what I am going to say is that if you're one of the first you will get a very, very special experience with a lot of free perks. So you're definitely going to want to be on that wait list if you're determined to beat your extreme hunger for good. And again, that's all I'm going to say about it for now, but I'll be sharing all the details soon. And if you're on my wait list, you don't need to worry because you shall be the first one to hear about it. So you can be the first one to learn everything you need to learn about extreme hunger and overcoming your extreme hunger so you can finally feel satisfied. Now, for today's episode, I wanted to dive into another extreme hunger topic, and that is the difference between extreme hunger and binge eating disorder. It is yet again a question I get asked about almost daily, so I figured I must make a dedicated podcast episode on it because that's what I'm here for. I'm here to answer your questions. So I figured to kick things off, I wanted to actually read a recent DM someone sent me. Dear Olivia, I have been eating so much food recently after deciding I was going to commit to full recovery from anorexia. I just can eat the entire kitchen and feel like nothing satisfies me and I am only craving unhealthy junk food. I feel so disgusting and ashamed and I have been gaining weight so quickly and I'm afraid I am now developing binge eating disorder. Even when I am so full after eating two jars of peanut butter, a pint of ice cream, and a whole pack of cookies, I cannot stop thinking about food, so I just keep eating until I feel super nauseous. Dot dot dot. Surely this cannot be normal? I am not sure if you will read this, but I am just in need of some guidance and 
Hope you can give me advice on what I should do. Sincerely, Anonymous. Okay, first of all, if you're listening to this and have ever contemplating sending me a DM or sending me an email and then didn't out of fear that I would never read it, I just want to say that I read all of my DMs and all of my emails as long as they, of course, don't land in my spam box. And I will always try to respond as best as I can because my community means more than anything to me and you are the reason I do what I do. And like I said before, I am here to answer your questions. I love answering your questions. It is so important to me that everyone going through hard times knows that they're not alone. And of course, every DM is different and every message is different, but when it comes to the topic of extreme hunger, a very common fear is that you are developing binge eating disorder and quote-unquote swinging to the other side after a period of being an energy deficit as a result of a restrictive eating disorder or just any type of disordered eating that is about restricting calories or food or you know what I mean. And I myself had this exact same fear when I was going through extreme hunger and it's completely understandable that we feel we're developing binge eating disorder because I mean, stuffing food in your face in a rapid tempo, downing sugary, high fat foods until you feel nauseous and consuming thousands upon thousands of calories in one sitting is just the definition of binge eating, right? Well, here's where I'd like to pull open the DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, and the 5 is because it's the 5th edition. They keep editing it to kind of make everything better. So this book is basically what all healthcare providers use to diagnose mental health issues. And the reason I do want to pull this book out, even if that's just from Google, because, I mean, who has a DSM-5 laying around, you know? The reason I want to pull the book out is because I want to go over the definition of binge eating disorder, or BED, together so we can establish, or rather relieve you of this fear that you are most likely not developing binge eating disorder. So, There are five specific criteria that one has to meet to be diagnosed with binge eating disorder. So I thought I'd just go through them with you, read them, so we can kind of learn why you probably don't have BED. So criterion one, which is titled, Recurrent Episodes of Binge Eating, states that an episode of binge eating must be characterized by both of the following. Number one, eating in a discrete period of time such as within any two-hour period, an amount of food that is definitely larger than most people would eat in a similar period of time under similar circumstances. Number two in this criterion is the sense of lack of control over eating during the episode, e.g. a feeling that one cannot stop eating or control what or how much one is eating. So you probably already have thoughts around this and so do I, but before I say anything about any of the five criteria that I'm going to be mentioning, I just want to go through all of them first so we have the full picture before saying anything or having any comments. That said, criterion two is titled, binge eating episodes are associated with three or more of the following, eating much more rapidly than normal, eating until feeling uncomfortably full, eating large amounts of food when not feeling physically hungry, eating alone because of being embarrassed by how much one is eating, and or feeling disgusted with oneself, depressed or very guilty after overeating. Criterion 3 simply states that one presents with distress regarding binge eating. Criterion 4 states that the binge eating occurs on average at least one day a week for three months. And lastly, criterion five states that the binge eating is not associated with the regular use of inappropriate compensatory behavior, e.g. purging, fasting, or excessive exercise, and does not occur exclusively during the course of anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa. Phew, so there's a lot to unpack here. 
but the fifth criteria is actually the only one you need to differentiate extreme hunger from binge eating disorder. Criterion 5 basically states that if there is any form of restriction or compensation involved, so this also means leading up to the overeating, it does not qualify as binge eating disorder. And to elaborate on that, someone who truly has diagnosable binge eating disorder does not need to come out of energy deficit like you do. And you may be wondering about the remaining four criteria in the beginning that specify eating more than what is considered a quote-unquote normal amount of food, feeling a lack of control around food, eating really fast, eating when not physically hungry, feeling guilty after eating, and all the other symptoms and emotions that are mentioned in the first four criteria. And considering those first four criteria, you may now be thinking, well, I match all of the first four criteria. So, Olivia, you haven't convinced me yet. Well, like I said, I don't need to convince you because that's what the fifth criteria is for. It was actually added to the later versions of the DSM because there was a very blurry line between real binge eating disorder and someone who displays symptoms of it during or after a restrictive eating disorder. Are you currently experiencing extreme hunger and do you fear that you're becoming a binge eater? Or perhaps you are constantly thinking of ways to deserve food or make up for it. Or you just feel overridden with gut-wrenching guilt every time you eat something unplanned or miss a workout. If any of that resonates, you are in luck because I am interrupting my very own episode to tell you about my one-on-one coaching program. One of my favorite quotes is that your mess will become your message and my coaching program was really born out of that. I created this program after being told that I was a hopeless case by a clinical psychiatrist over six years ago. I thought there was something wrong with me and that I was simply uncurable, but I quickly learned that I wasn't the only one being pushed aside by their doctors and healthcare providers. It was the system that was failing patients, not to mention how most treatment centers or insurance companies only support those who fit the eating disorder stereotypes. As the years went on and I finally dug myself out of the deep hole the eating disorder had created for me, I continued to hear horror story after horror story from clients being disregarded and being labeled as too complex by the so-called professionals. In the traditional healthcare system, it really is unfortunate that you fall between land and ship when you're dealing with more than one mental health issue, and you're often told to first quote-unquote fix the other issues before they can help you with tackling your eating disorder. But it does not work like that. An eating disorder never stands alone, so why should you? My promise when it comes to coaching is to guide you on the path to freedom, whatever that looks like for you. You don't need to fit a stereotype or be at a low weight or even feel sick enough to get help. In fact, if any part of your life is compromised by disordered eating, you are sick enough and have every right to help. Whatever you're going through right now, please know that you are never alone and I am so open to exploring how we can find freedom for you together. I have stood in your shoes and am so incredibly passionate about the power of lived experience. I thought that I was never going to get better. Yet here I am, thriving. And if I can do it, so can you. During our time together, we will approach your recovery holistically. We'll explore what's holding you back, discover what you need, and unlock your full potential. Because you are so beautiful and unique, my friend. You can schedule a free 30-minute discovery call with me at livelabelfree.com forward slash schedule. That's live label free like the name of this podcast dot com forward slash schedule so that's s-c-h-e-d-u-l-e i absolutely cannot wait to chat now let's get back to the episode and i 
know I said I wasn't needing to convince you, but before we move on, I do just really want to stress that whatever is considered a normal amount of food, whatever that means, someone with extreme hunger will need to eat way more than that anyways, because that's the only way you can pay off energy debt that you've built up. And again, if you don't know what I mean with the word energy debt or energy deficit, be sure that you've listened to the podcast episode on the biological importance of honoring your extreme hunger, because I really do explain it all there. And if you still have questions, of course, send me a message and I will respond ASAP, like I promised. And in regards to eating really fast, remember that this is your body being super clever and trying to ensure that you take advantage of the food while it's there, as it still cannot trust that another perceived famine is right around the corner. And this is the same reason you crave really high calorie, nutrient dense food, because your body is trying to acquire calories as quickly and efficiently as possible, and there's no more efficient way to consume energy than food that is really dense and high in calories. So to give a tangible example of all of this, imagine a child who has been kidnapped and locked in a room and is only given a couple of slices of bread to eat per day. Now, I know this is like very gruesome, but just bear with me. So this goes on for weeks, months, however long you want this example to be. Maybe you can fill in the amount of time you had your eating disorder. Anyways, the child is literally starving and his brain has perceived a famine because there is one. Then one day he's able to escape through the window of the room he has been locked up in and he runs away as fast as his little legs can carry him. And what do you think he'll do first? He'll probably, or guaranteed, eat a shit ton of food as soon as he sees food or as soon as that becomes available. And he'll eat that shit ton of food until he feels super nauseous and stuffed to the brim. And he then continues eating even though he feels super full because his survival brain has no idea that he's actually safe now because he was starving for such a long time. And it'll take a while for him of being free and back at home with his parents to feel safe around food again and trust that he won't be deprived of it anymore. And now that he is back home, he continues eating whatever his mom gives him, he sneaks into the kitchen for cookies, and eats everything just super fast and with incredible urgency. And why is this? Why does he eat so fast, even though he's safe at home? Well, because for his body, getting out of energy deficit is really urgent. All the body wants, all the body is primed to do is to ensure proper functioning so we can survive. And to ensure proper functioning, to ensure survival, one must have adequate fuel. Now, after that little story, I have a question for you. Would you tell this poor child he was developing binge eating disorder? No, of course not. Well, at least if you're like a nice person, of course not. (laughs) So why would you be developing binge eating disorder? Just like the child, you are simply hungry and in need of nutrients. And reminder here that hunger doesn't necessarily mean physical hunger. It, of course, includes mental hunger or any bodily signs that are triggering you to want or seek out food. Because this child needs to make up for all the restriction, even if that was completely unintentional on his part. And the exact same goes for you. It's not your fault that you fell into disordered eating or developed an eating disorder, but it is your responsibility to nourish yourself back to health. I have said this before in previous episodes and I will say it again. It is so much easier to take on a victim role and not take the hard, fearful action in recovery. But my friend, no one can do this for you. I repeat, no one can do recovery for you. No one can tell your body that food is abundant, not even your own eyes. Your survival brain has to understand that food is abundant, and your survival brain can only do this if you prove to it that food is abundant. So now, go prove to your body there is no famine. 
Go prove to your body that all the food it is asking for, all the food it could possibly want, whether this be physically or mentally, that you'll feed that to it. Your body is your friend, so please start treating it like you would a friend, or if you can't see it as a friend, treat your body like you would that poor starving child. And with that said, I hope this episode helped put into perspective that honoring your extreme hunger does not make you a binge eater, and I hope this episode has provided you with the reminder you need to continue or perhaps start honoring your extreme hunger. And as always, I would so appreciate it if you could screenshot this episode and share it to your IG stories if you got any value out of it. And if you want even more value and more guidance on coming to peace with your hunger and making this process easier, you can schedule a free consultation call for coaching with me or get on the waitlist for my extreme hunger course. I've been where you are, my friend. I have stood in your shoes. I have felt the fear and challenged the fear. So I can assure you that you're not alone. And I can assure you that you have what it takes to do this. We will definitely chat again soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>